History is not only the path left by the past, it can influence the present and can shape the future. We sit here today in the hope that our presence and our sense of responsibility today can make the world a better place for those who come after us. As the saying goes at the University of Pretoria, make today matter. In the context of today's dialogue and public lecture, allow me to offer an extension and say make today matter because a just energy transition matters. Our acting interim vice chancellor and principal, Professor Sino Maharaj, the Honorable Minister of Electricity, Dr. Hoshinso Ramakopa, Professor Brula Englisi Lotz, Energy Economics Unit from the, from the Faculty of Economics, fondly known as EMS, representatives of the Diplomatic Corp, Senior Management of the University of Pretoria, the Executive, Deans, Deputy Deans, Directors, and Heads of Departments, representatives of the EMS faculty, the United Nations, United, United Nations Development Program representatives and guests, panelists, of course, our virtual guests joining in from around the world, across South Africa, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Sounds a little, little weak in the room. Good morning. <laughs> Sounds more like it. Uh, my name is Emma Swasara. It's great. I'm so glad to be here today and thrilled to be part of the convening today. Without further ado, allow me to uh, introduce the acting interim vice chancellor and principal. He's a professor in the Department of Electrical, Electronic, and Computer Engineering. He was appointed as vice principal research, innovation, and postgraduate education last year, August. He was previously the head of Department of Electrical, Electronic, and Computer Engineering, and for eight years, he consumed that he was in that role and served as the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment, and Information Technology, fondly known as EBIT. He has a combined experience of more than 33 years in an in industry as a microwave and RF design engineer, a trailblazer in academia and consulting, he holds a PhD in engineering as a professional engineer registered with the Engineering Council of South Africa. He's a fellow of the South African Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers and senior member of IEEE. Now in 2018, he was the founding chair of the IEEE SA Section Vecular Technology Society known as VTS. That was a chapter that he was responsible for. Interestingly, since 2008, Professor Maharaj held the position of Centec Chair in Broadband Wireless Multimedia Communications. His research interests are in broadband wireless communications with a focus on 5G cognitive radio sensor, uh, looking at network resource allocation, wireless channel modeling, and edge computing communication systems. Quite complex work, as you can hear. Prof. Is, uh, was the president of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers and is the chair of the Tax Innovation Board, which is a high-tech business incubator and accelerator. A lot of businesses have come through through the work being done at Tax Innovation. And very interesting, he has more than 170 international peer-reviewed conference and uh, article journals as well. He's got two international patents and a winner of 10 national and international awards. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Professor as he takes the stage. Thank you, Progr thank you Program Director. I think, uh, thank you. I wasn't sure whether he was talking about me or who he was talking about. <laughs> the Honorable Minister of Electricity, uh, Dr. Ramakhova, our um, UNDP and the Presidential Climate Commission reps, special welcome, of course, to uh, Steve Nichols as well. Welcome, thank you for being here, wonderful. Uh, colleagues, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, welcome, especially welcome to our online viewers as well. Thank you for making the time on a winter morning to join us here, and it's very wonderful to have all of you here. I think it gives me great pleasure as a Vice Principal Responsible Research and Innovation at University of Pretoria, 
and uh, currently acting uh, vice chancellor and principal to welcome everyone here um, this morning to, of course, our one lovely Future Africa campus, um, what we call UP's African platform for collaborative research um, for this transformative public event. I think which is part of a joint partnership called the Just Energy Transition, or JET, as we all like to use the acronym. Uh, this partnership includes the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, the Presidential Climate Commission, PCC, and of course, uh, University of Pretoria's uh, Economics Unit um, uh, for our, in our Faculty of Economic Management Sciences, and of course, which conducts energy transitions or what we call JET-related research um, at UP. I think certainly a warm greeting, uh, as well as those who are joining us virtually. Again, thank you. And thank you to everyone who was involved in putting this event together. As you know, we started with the UNDP and the PCC, this whole uh, discussion between ourselves, uh, University of Johannesburg and University of Stellenbosch. And this is one of our contributions to this whole energy transition activity and discussion. And of course, to conduct research for evidence-based and importantly, it must be evidence-based and science-based so that we make informed decisions um, and the thought leadership for the implementation of a just energy transition in South Africa and hopefully the information, knowledge and experiences we can share with the rest of Africa and the world as well. A special welcome this morning to, of course, our minister, uh, Dr. Jose Enzo Ramachoba, the Minister of Electricity, of course, and certainly many of you may not know, he's a PhD graduate of this university as well. And he's going to address us on energy sovereignty in the context of a sustainable and just energy transition. And we are very thankful uh, for the availability of his time and expertise uh, in weighing in on this subject of critical importance and of course, we look forward to hearing your valuable insights, Minister. And uh, of course, hopefully from that, we'll follow an engaging discussion, both with our audience uh, here and uh, the online audience uh, going forward. I think the University of Pretoria is very passionate about partnerships. It is only through shared expertise and joint projects uh, that this is possible and we can get tangible results uh, achieved in, uh, because as I say in Africa, you know, we have the proverb, um, if you go fast, go alone, but if you go far, we go together. And this is part of this uh, work we do with everybody else. And we recognize that um, as the challenges and complexities of our disrupted times um, do not come neatly in packaged in silos, uh, fitting in neat boundaries, and of course uh, with borders, uh, academic disciplines and nations, as you know, normally professors like to work in the little cocoons and little silos. And we at University of Pretoria uh, embraced a whole new concept, what we call transdisciplinarity and interdisciplinary research offered um, the best opportunity, the best impact, and the best way of addressing what we may call sometimes the wicked problems, uh, so that we co-create new knowledge and find solutions to preparing the world's most pressing problems. And the world's missing, pressing problems are not unique to South Africa only. As we know, energy is not only a South African or an African challenge, it's a worldwide challenge. In the recent 2023 Times Higher Education Impact Rankings, um, University of Pretoria was ranked fourth in the world among more than uh, 3,000 institutions, fourth in for what we call in the SDGs, uh, decent work and economic growth. As you can see, we try to make a, a tremendous impact in terms of creating, as we know, with the typical negatives in South Africa of unemployment, inequality, and poverty, and we're trying to make our contribution to that. And furthermore, in 2023, the QS, QS is one of the major subject rankings in the world. Uh, South Africa and UP was number one for chemical engineering, electrical electronic computer engineering, mechanical engineering, law, economics, and economic, econometrics. And we think that these five key areas, among others, are very important in the JET work. And uh, we have the expertise at UP and we're willing to work with others. And we're committed to making a contribution and sharing our expertise through joint collaboration that makes sustainable, uh, makes the country and the world and the planet a sustainable place. Our energy economics unit here at the University of Pretoria is just one area where the university is demonstrating interest and commitment to the co-development of sustainable future solutions for the country, the continent, and the world. South Africa currently stands to be at the center of the global south just transition planning, and as such has a great opportunity uh, with the expertise we have in the country to play a key role both locally and globally. And all efforts, of course, needs to be considered within the context of the short and long-term effects of an already burdened South African economy and society. 
As we navigate the rapidly changing global environment, the balance to balance this, it is imperative for us to have sustainable growth, internal growth, and of course development. And I'm sure you will agree that it is an honor to play a, this part in contributing to this vit vital change uh, in our economy. And we look forward to our enriching time together. And I would like to place on record our sincere thanks to the UNDP and of course, especially uh, Dr. Ayodele Odusola, who could not be here today for his vision and commitment to start this whole initiative with the universities. I welcome you to University of Pretoria and our Future Africa Research Platform. And thank you for all for attending uh, this event. And I'm very confident that we will have an engaging, enriching and constructive dialogue this morning. Thank you very much and have a lovely morning with us. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. You described a university that has a local presence um, uh, and also a global presence and certainly making impact uh, right around the vicinity. Now, allow me to introduce uh, Steve Nichols, who's the head of mitigation at the Presidential Climate Commission, known as PCC. In his role, Steve works with a range of stakeholders to reach a consensus on net zero pathways for each sector of the economy to build a strong fact base and support capacity building and cooperation within South Africa. Also understanding future competitive economies and what kind of investments are required to enhance South Africa's economic competitive, competitiveness whilst creating employment and reducing inequality and poverty as a key focus. Steve's past experience is in connecting climate issues uh, with economic impact and therefore building uh, the strategic case for integrating climate considerations into strategy, risk management, investment planning, policy development, and implementation. Prior to joining the PCC, Steve led environmental and society programs at the National Business Institute, uh, rather at the National Business Initiative. In this role, Steve ran the programs that harness the collective effort of South African business across the energy, climate, and uh, climate change and water-related issues. Steve has worked in the consulting industry in the United Kingdom, and in South Africa and on projects in Europe, uh, Southern and East Africa. He has worked across several sectors, which include mining, telecommunications, government, electrical energy, oil and gas, as well as financial services and retail. Quite a well-versed uh, uh, gentleman we hear from. Uh, please do give him a round of applause as he makes his way forward. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll try to be quick. Um, we're here to hear the minister, so thank you for joining us, minister. Um, so the PCC is primarily concerned with the just transition, and the president put together the PCC, which is effectively a group of commissioners from uh, all of uh, our social partners in South Africa. Um, I work for the secretariat, and I'm responsible for a lot of the background modeling and thinking about how we might transition. Um, and uh, but, but all key to this is the just transition. So so we need to do all of these changes in the interest of the people of South Africa and addressing the triple challenge that was mentioned earlier. And so that's really the topic of today. Um, how we need to do that, um, the Presidential Climate Commission has released what we call the Just Transition Framework. This is the guidance of what, how do we think about the Just Transition? What is it? What are the principles to it? And there are a couple of key principles, uh, procedural, distributional, and restorative justice. And today is very much about the procedural justice element. How do we have a much more public, transparent debate about what we need to do uh, and, and how do we bring, um, as Prof. Maharaj mentioned, the sort of science and fact base into it. And so this partnership that we have with the UNDP is exactly about that. It's trying to create these public fora where we're able to debate the, the topics, debate the facts, um, and really get into the detail. Um, so we thank you all for being here today and for being online, and we're really interested and excited about today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's sick just word. He said it would be as brief as he could, and he really was. So thank you for that. Um, moving on to, I'd like to introduce Professor Brula Ingressi Lotz, who is a prominent scholar at the University of Pretoria, uh, specializing in energy and environmental issues. She has an impressive publication record with over 90 academic uh, papers in international journals, which is an incredible achievement, I must tell you. It's hard to write one journal article and then imagine 90 in uh, 
international article, so it's really impressive. Uh, she serves as the editor for respected journals like Energy Policy, Energy Economics, and Environmental Science and Pollution Research. She holds key roles in professional organizations, including the Vice President for Membership and Affiliate, affiliate Relationships of the International Association for Energy Economics, and was past president of the South African Association for Energy Economics. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause. Thank you very much, everyone. Welcome. Those of you that know me, they, you know that I'm not very good with protocol, so I'm going to say all protocol observed. Good morning again, and welcome to this, this um, important occasion. It is with great honor and privilege that I stand before you representing the University of Pretoria, the EMS faculty, and the Energy Economics Unit. We're here today um, to discuss a very important issue. But before I delve into the importance of the specific UNDP Just Energy Transition Platform and the national discussion on the Just Energy Transition, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the dignitaries present, especially to Honorable Minister of Electricity, Dr. Amohova, for graciously accepting our invitation to join us here today. To be honest, I wasn't sure if he's going to accept when I sent the request. <laughs> he is a very busy man. Your presence here further underscores the importance of this event and your commitment to diving to driving sustainable and progressive change in the energy sector. Ladies and gentlemen, the urgency of addressing climate change and its adverse impacts on our planet and communities has never been clearer. In the past year, the notion of a jet, as we all call it now, has been a focal point in discussions hosted by esteemed organizations, reiterating the significance <coughs> excuse me, in guiding our nation's energy transformation. The just energy transition is more than just an abstract concept. It's not a term. It is an approach it, that emphasizes equitable and fair energy access, decarbonization, and the creation of opportunities for economic growth while simultaneously addressing social and environmental challenges. It is a transition that will shape the trajectory of our energy landscape, but it also holds the potential to transform lives and uplift communities, something that we really need. Informed by these insights, the UNDP, in partnership with PCC, as we heard already, convened the Just Energy Transition Platform to deep dive into these critical areas. The JET platform provides space for, uh, for cross-sectoral, sectoral, transdisciplinary and diversified discussions to unlock and build thought leadership around the Just Energy Transition implementation processes. By promoting policy-oriented research, stimulating critical debates, and drawing on experiences from both the Global South and Global North, the JET platform aims to bridge the gap between the national vision for a just transition in South Africa and the practical realization on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, I firmly believe that the success of this platform and the overall just energy transition journey hinges on the power of collaboration. The endeavor, the endeavor requires active participation and partnership from industry, academia, policymakers, and all relevant stakeholders, and that's what we're trying to do today. By bringing together these minds from diverse backgrounds, we can harness the strength of collective wisdom, expertise, and resources to design sustainable evidence-based solutions. As researchers, academics, and policy experts, we have a unique responsibility to provide evidence-based insights that guide decision-making in this crucial phase of our nation's development. It is our duty to support policymakers in understanding the, implication, the implications of various energy um, transition pathways and to present them with well-informed policy and strategic recommendations. However, the journey towards a just energy transition will undoubtedly present challenges. But they are challenges that we must embrace collectively. We cannot afford to leave anyone behind as we embark on this transformative path. Therefore, the JET platform is also serving as a learning exchange platform for leaders where we can share knowledge, best practices, and lessons learned to learn from each other and empower each other on this just transition process. 
In conclusion, I would like to reiterate the importance of our collective commitment to this cause. The just energy transition is not just an aspiration. We used to discuss if it's going to happen. Now it has to happen. It is happening. It is an imperative for, our, for the well-being of our society and the preservation of our planet for future generations. Together, we can pave the way for a sustainable and equitable energy future in South Africa. Once again, I extend my deepest gratitude to all the esteemed guests present here today, and I eager, eagerly anticipate a very fruitful, interesting discussion. Thank you for your attention, and let us embark on this journey of positive change together. Thank you. So we, before we proceed any further, let me um, have the honor to introduce you and share with you a brief bio note of our esteemed guest, Dr. Ramahopa. Dr. Hocienzo Ramahopa is the minister in the presidency responsible for electricity. And prior to this, he held the position of head of investment infrastructure office in the presidency. He also served as the Gauteng MEC for economic development. Uh, sorry, economic development, agriculture and environment. Previously, he held the position of executive mayor of the city of Chuane between 2010 and 2016. At the time, he was among the youngest mayors of a metropolitan in the country. Among his previous positions in Korea includes holding the position of chief executive officer for both the metropolitan trading company and the Johannesburg market. Dr. Mohopa also served as the board deputy chairperson of trade and investment in Limpopo. Thank you for your attention, and it is my honor to invite Honorable Minister to join me on the podium. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lotz, for the generous uh, introduction. Let me take the opportunity to extend uh, my own and sincere greetings uh, to uh, Professor Maharaj. Uh, it feels great to be back home. As you have indicated, this is my uh, alma mater. Um, the citadel of uh, intellectual discourse. And I'm very confident that uh, in the course of uh, the presentation, I'll be able to surface uh, some of my thinking around the areas of uh, what we call the uh, just energy transition, and, and also what are some of the dynamics that uh, uh, figure or, or shape the, the conversation. I must say that this is uh, one of the most uh, polarizing conversation of our time. Um, I mean, if you come to think of it, there are two polar opposites to the conversation on the extreme end of the continuum is those who argue that uh, we have to ensure that we decarbonize uh, at all costs because we need to preserve uh, posterity and uh, its interest. And uh, on the other polar opposite are those who are arguing that uh, there has to be super exploitation of uh, our resource to make sure that we are able to meet the uh, uh, the demands of the now and be able to uh, build an industrial base uh, so that uh, we are able to take people out of uh, conditions of uh, abject poverty, we are able to um, uh, ensure that we, we achieve our uh, the best that uh, the various countries uh, can, uh, can achieve, uh, essentially their potential. And of course there's something in the middle there that uh, does not receive uh, sufficient, uh, sufficient attention. So I'm going to take you through a, a presentation, and in the course of that, of course, I'm going to surface some of the dynamics that they uh, obtain in the South African uh, situation, and of course, uh, uh, some of these uh, issues uh, are such that, uh, like I said, they are contentious. Uh, so the first thing is that the conversation, um, uh, you find that it's uh, environmental-centric, uh, Essentially, it's, uh, it's biased towards uh, ecological considerations. And what this uh, illustrates is that uh, load shedding has had uh, a devastating impact on uh, the South African economy. You can see that the uh, output uh, was uh, affected uh, really by about 1.25 uh, uh, trillion rands. And at the current rate of uh, unmet demand, and uh, a modeling was done by the South African Reserve Bank, and that suggests that uh, at uh, 1,000 um, megawatts of unmet demand, uh, the focus with regards to this uh, output uh, is about 1.6 trillion rands. And you can see that it's got a direct impact on the lived experiences of uh, an average person in the country. Um, 
um, employment that was lost uh, as a direct result of, uh, of load shedding was put uh, in 2022. We lost over 600,000 jobs. And then the modeling suggests that uh, at the rate at which uh, load shedding is intensifying going into the future, we're potentially going to lose close to 850,000 jobs. And also the National Revenue Fund is uh, adversely affected. Uh, last year we lost about uh, 61 billion uh, rands in, uh, in revenues and the projection is that we are likely going to lose about 77 billion rand. That measure is important because it talks to the ability of government to be able to sustain the social wage, to provide, uh, if you like, free basic services to the poor, the SRD grant. So the point I'm making is that uh, at the rate at which you are un unable to uh, meet the demand, it compromises government's ability to take care of the poor. So I'm lifting, if you like, the issues around the, the, the economic dimensions of this conversation, and I'm saying it shouldn't be uh, lost on us. And what this slide really seeks to do is just to uh, model, uh, if you like, energy demand and access on the African continent. So I'm, I'm trying to make the point that, again, in the conversation, so I've raised the issues around the, the socioeconomic uh, impact, and then there are issues around the energy famine. People are not necessarily connected uh, to the grid. So as we, we have this conversation around uh, the just energy transition, one of the elements that uh, uh, should characterize that conversation is the need for us to accelerate the connection of people to the grid or access to, to electricity, uh, if you like, because uh, there's energy famine on the continent. I think uh, uh, in some parts of the continent, 70% of those uh, people in those countries are not connected to the grid. In the South African situation, of course, we are sitting at about 7% uh, of households that are not connected to the grid. So as we have the conversation, it is important that uh, we also talk about the extent and the rate at which we are going to connect uh, those who are not connected. Of course, I do accept that you are going to leapfrog. I mean, the technology doesn't necessarily follow that. People have to be connected to the grid. And I think one of the biggest innovation that has come out of this uh, transitioning is the ability for us to generate or create microgrids. People don't have uh, to rely on municipal connection for them to have uh, access to electricity. Uh, we are having what we call distributed uh, grid connection, the rooftop solar solutions. So those provide, if you like, opportunities for us to quickly connect people uh, to have access to electricity. So I'm raising a second dimension in relation to the conversation around the, the just uh, energy transition. Just yesterday, I was having a conversation with the mayors in the Mpumalanga area, and these mayors were raising the question and say, but mayor, the primary anchor of the economy in this space is uh, mining and also the, uh, the, the power stations here. So if you close, you decommission what happens to this space. So what I'm saying is that we need to answer that question to say that uh, as we move uh, forward with decommission, it's important that we create new economies that is uh, going to either absorb the existing skills or reskill people and reconfigure that space to ensure that uh, uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't become uh, an area that is deserted in economic terms, but we are able to, to generate, uh, if you like, uh, new opportunities for people in, uh, in, uh, in those spaces. And of course, uh, there's uh, issues around uh, what the, the, the consumption and the generation trends are going into the future. So what we are seeing is that the renewables uh, uh, constitute the future. Um, and you see that uh, as a result of the energy famine that uh, exists in many parts of the continent, renewables provides the best opportunity for us to connect people quicker to, uh, to uh, uh, electricity or give them access to electricity. So we have uh, a significant endowments on the continent. I mean, uh, the irradiation levels on the continent are superior than any other uh, part of uh, the world. We know that we've got significant amount of real estate. There's land that is uh, unoccupied. We can exploit that. We have rivers that flow uh, 365 a year. You are, we are able to generate uh, hydro. So the point we are making is that the renewables are 
going to are constituting the future, uh, the ones that are likely going to help us to accelerate the connection of people to, to energy. And then there are issues around the uh, funding and uh, financing. A lot of these uh, countries uh, don't have uh, the right balance sheet to support the kind of uh, investments that have to be made in those spaces. So we need to think creatively about the kind of financing that uh, can be made available for us to be able to roll out uh, to roll out these, uh, these solutions. And then there are issues uh, from government side. There has to be policies that makes it possible for this funding and financing to flow into these countries. Of course, the South African experience is that we have liberalized uh, uh, the generation side. We have uh, removed the uh, cap on embedded generation. So essentially, you don't need to have a license from NERSA. You simply register your project. And that's why we are beginning to see a healthy pipeline of projects. As I speak to you, we have about 66 gigawatts of projects that are private sector sponsored. And this have, has become possible as a result of, uh, of uh, the removal of, uh, uh, if you like, the onerous uh, 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 licensing requirements on the generation side. And then again, base load uh, is going to be a key because of the intermittency of these uh, renewable energy solutions. They rely on the redundancy of base load. So I guess that gas will continue to become part of the configuration of the mix. So the issue really is about the optimal mix of these uh, energy sources. So it's not about discussing, discarding one in favor of the other. It's about how we find an, a healthy mix so that we are able to ensure that uh, we, we, we provide the kind of uh, support and uh, access uh, that is required to be able to drive these uh, agendas. Part of the work that has been done really is about uh, the, the, the various um, uh, if you like, uh, configurations around the, um, uh, the transition uh, story. So if you look at uh, China, for an example, what uh, I call, we call uh, archetypes of um, uh, energy security scenario. So China has got uh, a significant demand because of the size of the population. They've got an inordinate amount of uh, resources. So they are not really susceptible to movements, uh, price movements in relation to uh, some of these energy sources. They are able to provide uh, for themselves and, and therefore what China does, it uses those resources they demand to drive their industrial capacity and also to invest a bit in uh, research to ensure that they keep up with the pace in relation to innovations in the uh, renewable space. And then you have what we call the green team. This is primarily your more advanced uh, affluent uh, European countries. They don't necessarily have uh, the, the, the resources that are required or the resources are diminishing over a period of time, but they've got the money, they've got the agenda, they, they are committed to a, an agenda of decarbonization, and they are prepared to pay a premium for that decarbonization. The issues around the green hydrogen is an excellent example of that. So the Western industrialized countries are prepared to pay a premium because they are committed to this decarbonization agenda. Uh, they are prepared to pay, uh, uh, make investments in the innovation to ensure that, uh, uh, if you like, the, the curve is steep from a, an innovation point of view. And of course, once we succeed, we are able to bring down the cost associated with green hydrogen. The rest of the world will be able to benefit from that. So that's uh, some of the two examples that I wanted to give in relation to how countries are approaching the issues around the, around the, um, uh, the green uh, transition, or if you like, the energy transition. So you can see that uh, it's a mixed bag, and, and there are those uh, really what I call uh, archipelagos. Uh, these ones are committed to the super exploitation of their resource, uh, very little attention to the decarbonization agenda. Their argument is that uh, we need to industrialize, we must exploit uh, the resources that we have. And of course, much later we'll, we'll take account of uh, the implications of, uh, of uh, not the uh, decarbonization. So the point, uh, what I'm making is that there's a tapestry of uh, approaches here, and these approaches are at polar opposites. And I think that conversations of this nature can help us to mitigate or mediate rather this conversation so that we are able to, to resolve the question. Just on the strategic levers, I think there are huge uh, uh, possibilities and potential on the, on the African continent. I think we're able to, to map, uh, if you like, opportunities to support and increase uh, regional power trading in Southern Africa. I think what has been missing in the conversation, uh, of course, that is in government, is the potential 
potential that resides in other countries. Of course, there's been major exploration of gas uh, in Namibia. We know that it exists also in uh, Mozambique. And it's for us to look at these opportunities as a region, as opposed to isolated individual uh, countries uh, protecting the sovereign. And we think that there's a greater value in us uh, looking at these opportunities as a region. And if there's that interconnectedness, we already have uh, the SADC, uh, the regional pool, your ability to import and export electricity, uh, 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 electrons. And I think uh, uh, you'll see that uh, the opportunities are vast uh, for us to be able to resolve the issues of energy famine, the issues of uh, access to, to the grid, the issues of uh, us supporting our industrial base uh, to be able to create the kind of necessary, the jobs that are required. I mean, the great INGA is a potential that is, uh, has not been uh, fully exploited. We know that we can get up to 20, 22,000 uh, megawatts of uh, renewable uh, energy. That's a hydro, uh, if you like, uh, solution. And I think South Africa is going to be a big enabler of us being able to invest in the INGA because uh, the projection is that we can draw up to 5,000 megawatts. And once we commit to that, the project becomes bankable. Investors are able to invest and, of course, will realize the full potential of what INGA can give us, the 22,000 uh, um, uh, uh, megawatts over a period of time. But South Africa has to move first for us to be able to achieve that. And that's why we are having uh, uh, conversations uh, with, uh, with uh, our, P our, our our peers from the, the DRC. And this is really the potential of um, um, the, 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 the decarbonization agenda, as uh, exploiting our renewable energy sources. So you can see that uh, the renewable uh, uh, energy independent power producer program has been able to create significant opportunities in the South African uh, economy. Uh, so we have been able to compute the, the total investments that have been made in this area that has found traction in the South African economy is upwards of uh, about uh, 209 billion rand. And 20% of that is foreign investment. And then the second part is that it has been able to create uh, quality jobs. Quality in that these jobs can be sustained. Uh, these jobs uh, require the, the reskilling of uh, existing capacity. They can be sustained over a period of, uh, over a period of time, 60,000 of these uh, have been cr uh, created as a result of the RIP program. And once we become aggressive in this decarbonization agenda, of course, these uh, numbers will increase uh, exponentially. So the biggest message that is com coming out of this is that as you decarbonize, there are opportunities for you to create new job opportunities to attract uh, additional investments. And you can see that this model is now exported to other parts of, uh, of the region. So Zambia is following the same route, and of course Ethiopia is also following the same route, essentially borrowing from the template that South Africa has used, uh, first move advantage. Of course, they are last movers. They are likely going to uh, temper with this and, 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 and domesticate it to their own conditions. But what is important, the message is that uh, there's huge economic benefits in the decarbonization agenda, the issues of jobs and investments and new technology of course, it goes without saying the reductions in, re in relation to emissions levels and protecting the interest of, uh, of posterity. And then there are issues that um, requires attention. As we, as we have this conversation about the, uh, the decarbonization, the, the JET uh, program, and they present what I call the uh, emerging opportunities in the renewable value chain. So the first one is issues around the public uh, procurement. So it's important that uh, we are able to introduce regulations that makes it possible for this um, uh, kind of technology to find traction. I made the point earlier on that we have liberalized on the, on the generation side. We have made it possible for new entrants to come into the place. ESCOM is no more a monopoly, but a big market player. But we can see going into the future that there's going to be a significant participation of private sector uh, players uh, in that space. So we've opened up that space. And then there are issues around the energy storage uh, technology. We know that the existing technology gives us up to four hours of battery storage, and I'm sure uh, more investments in this space were able to increase the storage 
capacity and the number of hours uh, that uh, we can draw from this storage capacity because one of its limitations is around uh, uh, that four hour window, if you like, of uh, storage capacity. And of course, when you compare it uh, with pump storage, pump storage gives you significant amount of storage. So I think that greater investments in this area is going to help us to improve, uh, improve that situation. And then the other one is, um, of course, private procurement of a new generation. I've made the point that we've got a pipeline now of about 66 gigawatts of renewable energy projects. So these are projects that come from energy intensive users and also just uh, small industries. They have come into that this space. Of course, in this instance, it's induced by load shedding, but of course, some of them had foresight about what the future holds and they want to harness and exploit the these resources that are confronting us. It's not load shedding, you see. <laughs> I, I hope it's not load shedding. Well, I don't know the schedule. I, I had time myself not to be here when there's load shedding to, uh, to avoid embarrassment. So <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so I think that's the point I, I was making. And then we also talk about the transmission. So one of the structural constraints in, 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 in drawing from the renewable is the configuration of the grid. So if you look at the South African grid, it's concentrated, the density is in the northeastern part of the country. And that is for a reason. So historically, you know that the, the major fuel source in the country has been coal, and the, the coal reserves are in Pumalanga, and the tradition or the practice is that the coal-fired power stations are um, constructed at the mouth of uh, the source, and that's the coal, and therefore the density of your transmission lines is in Mpumalanga. And if you look at this uh, configuration again, uh, about 72% of the load is in the northern part of the country. Essentially, it's Gauteng going to the north because industry was locating, located closer to sources of uh, energy, energy generation so that you are able to minimize your transmission losses. You didn't want the electrons to travel for an inordinate amount of uh, distance because as you do that, you expose yourself to technical losses or transmission losses. And there's very little that is happening to the south of the country. And here I'm talking the Western Cape, Eastern Cape, and also the, the Northern Cape. I think I know it from, the, from my head. It's fine. Um, that was for illustration purposes because the configuration of the grid is important for you to have a, a visual appreciation, but technology has failed us. So that's the co configuration of the grid. But if you had to do an irradiation atlas, uh, by this I mean if you had to map where do you get the best quality of irradiation? is really concentrated in the Northern Cape. If you had to do a wind atlas asking the question, where do I get the best wind speeds in the country? You find them in the coastal areas of the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape. Now, when, when, you, want, when you want to exploit that, uh, that resource, you find that uh, you can generate the electrons, but you can't evacuate them. You can't evacuate them because there's no transmission capacity. So as we have the conversation about the just energy transition in the South African context, it's also about transmission capacity that enables the economy to benefit from these electrons that are generated from these renewable sources. And the point we are making is that we are unable to exploit that because of a lack of capacity in the Western Cape, in the Eastern Cape, and also in the, um, in the yes, in the Western Cape, the Eastern Cape, and the, and the Northern Cape. So you can see the, the areas where these are where you find the best uh, irradiation levels, uh, or uh, wind speeds, uh, the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape, and this is where you find the best irradiation level. But your transmission capacity is uh, concentrated there. So it's important that we are able to, to build a grid to allow for us to be able to exploit these uh, resources. Uh, if you look at what ESCOM has done over the past 10 years, they've rolled out oh, about 4,000 kilometers of new lines. And for us to benefit from this renewable energy resources, we need to build about 14,000 new lines in the next 10 years. So it means that this must increase by 3.5 uh, uh, times uh, what has been the capacity of ESCOM over that, uh, that period. And we know that the ESCOM balance sheet is uh, constrained. We know that the fiscal matrix is uh, compromised. So we need to tap into private sector uh, resources. The significant liquidity that is sitting with the private sector. So we must design solutions 
in such a way that we are able to tap from private sector to invest in grid expansion so that we are able to benefit from these renewable energy resources. So the point I'm making is that that just energy transition, the degree and scale uh, with which we are able to benefit from this is a function in the South African context of that the grid access and grid capacity. And it's something that is receiving our attention. But just to give you comfort, there's something that is being done now. So you can see that in the Western Cape, we are running, as I speak to you, there's uh, about uh, uh, 47 uh, trans, uh, projects that we are running. We anticipate to uh, get about 1,100, 11,000, I'm sorry, uh, 904 megawatts of a new capacity from, a, from the Western Cape. We are expecting 7,000 new capacity from the Eastern Cape. So you can see that these two, they contribute disproportionately to the new sources of generation capacity because of those irradiation levels that you are getting in the Eastern Cape and the, and the, and the, and the Western Cape. And you can see the next big area where we are going to get significant amount of resources is the Northern Cape because of those uh, of uh, the irradiation levels in those areas. And for us to be able to exploit all of these things, you need to build that grid capacity. So that conversation, in addition to the socioeconomic uh, consideration, the issues of uh, universal access, it also has to look at uh, the technical issues in relation to what can be achieved given the, the grid. And also the issue of the grid gives us an opportunity for us to be able to industrialize on the back of this crisis. So what do I mean? There are those vast opportunities. I've illustrated that uh, a lot of the households, communities on the continent, they are not necessarily connected to the grid. They don't have access to electricity. So as we go to the next level of, uh, if you like, solutions to provide uh, electricity access, uh, energy to these uh, communities, we must make it possible for us to be able to industrialize. So essentially, if you were to uh, roll out uh, uh, 14,000 kilometers of new lines, you must produce uh, those assets in the country. You must produce those components in the country so that the, the jobs that are displaced in the mining communities of Mpumalanga can then migrate into these new other new areas that will support the issues of, uh, of uh, decarbonization. So that at the worst case scenario, the net jobs um, uh, the net job scenario should be zero, but the best case scenario, it should, uh, it should be positive. And we are more than confident, if you do the numbers, that the, the, the net job scenario will be positive. And that's a just element uh, that I'm referring to in relation to jobs and how you are able to ensure that the people don't go hungry as a result of the transition. But of course, we have taken care of, uh, of everything. So really what I was trying to share with you was uh, what I refer to the possibility of us crafting the South African and, if you like, an African and nuances of the just transition so that we give it a, our local characteristics, that there are minimum elements that it must satisfy so that uh, everyone feels that they are accommodated and, as uh, Prof. Lord has indicated, no one is, uh, is left behind. And if you have this conversation, you are able to democratize it. Uh, we are very tolerant to views that are different from ours and find a way of synthesizing these views in the interest of the country, the sovereign, and its people, I'm sure, will be able to overcome these challenges. But thank you very much for the invitation, and we wish you well in the debate. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Minister. Thanks for sharing your insights and putting us into context with uh, the work that you've been doing, and also um, the work does show there's a lot of research that's been taken to arrive to share some of the stats that you shared, so thank you for that. I wouldn't do justice to the occasion if I didn't ask any questions, uh, but we've got a question that came online uh, that says that low base economic growth and high unemployment to various structural and institutional issues is no doubt making any transition difficult as is usually some adjustment cost to any change in the short run. How have these factors influenced the transition plan, if at all? Well, I, I, I do make the point that um, part of the, the difficulty in the, in the conversation, like, I mean, the experience I shared with you yesterday when I was meeting with the mayors, who are hosting some of these uh, coal-fired power stations. 
was to say about the economy is going to be decimated as a result of, uh, of the decommissioning. And I think it's important that uh, we are able to illustrate that uh, as a result of uh, the decarbonization and the decommissioning, of course, by definition of uh, these power stations, we are able to create new opportunities for those uh, spaces. I mean, I did share with you that uh, we've got about 66 uh, gigawatts of renewable energy um, uh, projects in the country, uh, primarily wind and solar PV, and I think solar constitute about 80% of, uh, of that pipeline. So there's opportunity for us to localize manufacturing production of those panels in the country, issues around battery and, uh, and inverters, uh, so that you are able to reskill the, 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 the people who are now, uh, uh, whose uh, employment is based in the fossil fuel sector, to be able to participate substantially in the, in, the, in the new economy that we are creating. And the point I was making right at the end is that the, 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 the employment picture at West should be zero, the net, and then at best we are confident that it can be positive. So in this way you are able to uh, mediate this tension between the binaries, uh, uh, these opposites, uh, so that there's an appreciation that, okay, as we decarbonize, we move away from fossil fuels. As we transition, we are not decimating the, the economic prospects of these spaces, but essentially it's anchored on, on new, on new uh, uh, solutions. And, and part of the work that we are doing as a ministry working with those uh, uh, municipalities is to see how best we can localize some of these uh, um, uh, components manufacturing, and they should be located in those spaces. Otherwise, uh, you are going to decimate the economies of those areas. Conversations like this can help us. I mean, academia is renowned for finding solutions, uh, even in very complex uh, and difficult situations. And it's just to help us to see how best you be, uh, uh, localize and uh, uh, create an industrial base for the country to be able to take uh, advantage of these opportunities. And then we must see it beyond the, the domestic borders. I mean, in the context of the Africa continental free trade area, the export opportunities going onto the continent, I did indicate that uh, a significant proportion of communities in the African countries don't have access to electricity. They don't necessarily have to be connected to the grid because of uh, the emergence of these uh, microgrids. And we can be supporting if you like those solutions and build our industrial base and it must be export orientated uh, so that we create more jobs on the back of the decarbonization agenda. Yeah, incredible. I, I think that makes a lot of sense and explains uh, part of what you've also highlighted in your presentation. I do know, on the, you know, based on time, I can't take a lot of questions, but if I may, Minister, just one question from the floor. Uh, anybody that would uh, like to uh, yes, I saw the first hand at the back here. Yeah? Perhaps I'll give her the mic so long and then uh, you can fire away. Uh, please just say your name and where you're from and ask your question. I'm Professor Krishna Duplessis. I'm head of the Department of Architecture at UP. And I've been working in this energy space for a long time at the CSIR. So I've got two points in a question. And the one is that while I don't agree with the methods that Extinction Rebellion has been using, they have a very valid point and that the conversation and the polarity is not about between environmentalists on the one hand and socioeconomic development on the other side. The polarity is between choosing life or death. That is where we are at the moment. We are sitting in this situation because for 20 years we've known what we need to do. We know what is going to go and we had the time and the resources to have a gradual transition. We no longer have that luxury. We're now in a very rapid transition. So we need to take that into account. Things need to happen very quickly much, much faster than they used to be, and we're going to have far less resources to do that work. So that's my two points, leave it at that. My question, though, is that we keep on talking about the grid and about our best solar radiation sitting in the Northern Cape, which is true, and this is also something that we've known about for 20 years, and for 20 years there's been resistance about extending the grid into the Northwest. But if we look at the world solar radiation map, we'll see that Mpumalanga, the solar irradiation in Mpumalanga, where we actually have the transmission lines at this point, is much higher than it is in Spain or in Europe or any of the other places where they are putting up huge solar plants. So why can't we just shift our thinking and have the solar where we have the transmission lines? And that is also creating the jobs where the people already are. So that's my question to you. Thank you. 
I can. No, no, that's a valid point. I, I should have qualified my statement on the best irradiation level and the best wind speed to say that I'm talking a, a, a intra-country. So essentially, if you look at South Africa, your best irradiation levels are in the Northern Cape. You are absolutely correct. If you go to almost any part of the country, uh, the irradiation levels are much better than most of Europe. So your point is valid. So I should have made that qualification. So what are we doing going forward? So one of the things you will see now, when we come out with the, the next bit windows, we don't allow the market to direct us because what the market will do, they'll do their studies uh, on the in the country and say the best irradiation is in the Northern Cape and you find that uh, the pipeline that is generated from solar PV will come from the Northern Cape because they're able to optimize efficiency and all of that because of the irradiation level. When we do the next round of bid windows, we are matching grid capacity um, with uh, where we want these uh, solutions to come from. Exactly your point. You'll see in the next round, we are directing the market that we are going to give you this uh, access in the Houting and in Pumalanga because of those reasons. There's a sunk cost, the assets are there, and it's quicker for us to evacuate. So you're absolutely correct. That's the next phase which we will see. We've made a, an announcement when I did my uh, weekly uh, briefing. I did make the point that we are taking, directing the market that you will be in these spaces because there's existing grid capacity. And of course, in Pumalanga, as you make this transition, you are able to create the jobs there at the source as people move from a coal-based economy into a green one. Essentially, they don't have to move uh, uh, geographies. They must remain in that space. So you are perfectly correct. So I, I take uh, everything that you are saying, and we are responding in that manner. Thanks, Prof. Incredible. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the, the questions. I appreciate there's a lot of questions in the room, uh, and, I, and I must say that we have a panel discussion after this. We're going to take a short break, so don't uh, keep those questions with you. It would be nice to engage a little deeper, a little further as well, with our panel uh, ex experts who will be joining the panel after the short break. Uh, if you may, we'll take a short break for about 10 minutes. We'll be back at about quarter past 10, uh, but allow me to Thank the Minister. Minister, thank you for making time today. I know that you're on schedule and you need to rush somewhere quickly, but uh, the University of Pretoria does thank you for coming through to start the conversation. And as many people continue uh, to follow the conversation, this is a great starting point to raise awareness and hopefully to achieve the, the goals that we have in mind. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our uh, incredible day here. We're talking all things the just energy transition. Uh, if you're just joining us online, you're most welcome. Uh, we move over to what is probably the most exciting part around the dialogue, around uh, the conversation. We have a panel discussion now. So I'll be happy to introduce our panelists to you now uh, before the conversation does begin. Uh, Ms. Lamini is an advo advocate for accelerated participation of Afri African women and youth in Africa's power and energy sector. Uh, she is the founding president of African Women in Energy and Power. Uh, she, it's an organization she founded to accelerate the participation of African women entrepreneurs in the full value chains of power and energy in Africa and contribute towards addressing the continent's energy poverty. And the organization has 11 chapters in, South Af in Africa. And uh, she's uh, quite a, a contributor as well. She's also founded a retail group. Uh, it's a group of companies that's a consulting group with interests in management consulting and energy and power consulting solutions. So welcome to the panel. Our next uh, panelist, uh, also in no particular order as well, is uh, Gaylo Mont Mason Clare. He's a senior economist at Trade and Industry Policy Strategies, typically known as TIPS. You might be familiar if you're familiar with their work. He leads uh, TIPS work on sustainable and just transition. He's a facilitator for the South African Renewable Energy Master Plan and Industrialization Plan for South Africa's Renewable Energy Value Chain. Welcome to the panel. Dr. Raj Paul is uh, the General Manager at ESCOM's Just Energy Transition Office. With uh, complete accountability for ESCOM's transition to a low carbon future, he is a hands-on mechanical engineer with professional 
ECSA registration, has an MBA and, uh, in, in governance and certificate of compliance and a PhD from Gibbs. So welcome back to your alma mater. And our next panelist is Mr. Salas Mzengili Zimu. He has uh, studied all over the world. He studied, uh, he's got a master's in engineering that he got in the UK, also studied uh, in the US at Stanford University, also studied in Singapore, but got a lot of experience. He's uh, worked uh, and also received multiple awards as well in the process, but he's held board positions at City Power. He's also held position at Sutherland India and South Africa's independent power producers, as well as SA Wind Energy Association, Association for Municipal, Municipal Electricity Utilities and Pekka's Trust, just to mention a few. So he's been in the heart of the conversation, but also uh, practically hands-on with it as well. He's appointed this year as a special advisor to the Minister of Electricity. So great to have you on the platform. And of course, we uh, have a, uh, who will be facilitating the conversation today, Dr. Jessica Bowman, who holds a PhD in economics from the University of Pretoria. She previously completed her Bachelor of Economics from Monash University and a Master of Commerce from the University of Pretoria. In addition, she completed certificate courses in regional and dynamic computable general equilibrium modeling, which is uh, presented at, by the Center of Policy Studies in Melbourne and an advanced certificate course in emerging markets and risk analysis from Fordham University in New York, who also have a strong relationship uh, with the University of Pretoria. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, without further ado, I'd like to call on Jessica to fire away with the panel conversation. Please give them a round of applause as it. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, welcome again to all the panelists. Thank you for making the time for being here. Um, let's address the elephant in the room. Um, good. I would guess that any protest leads to good publicity, and we knew with the uh, caliber of the person we had um, present, we, we will get something in such public event. Um, I'm happy to see that the presentation of the minister really could have addressed some of the, of the comments and the, how do we say, the worries that we all have. It's not only certain groups, we all have these worries. We all have the worries of how do we do this transition in a fair way. Um, not only how can we finance the transition, transition, also how does it affect the people on the ground. Um, we know our power and generic mix is coal based. Uh, we are moving from there, we hear and we see the plans. Um, so before saying more on that, I would like to open um, the panel. Um, perhaps Silas would like to start first. Um, from comments and thoughts, key, key thoughts we can get from what we hear the minister talking. Yeah, thanks. Uh, still morning, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, thanks for inviting us. It, it, it's actually an honor to be invited to an institution such as this. In 2017, I think I was invited by the same institution um, and I warned that um, if we don't do a lot of new generation combined with the demand side management, we're going to have another load shedding. The rest is history. Basically, if you look around the globe, we're not a unique country as South Africa. By age of uh, installed infrastructure, we're the same as everybody else. Uh, where we seem to be lacking in, on managing those uh, installed infrastructure, on introducing the um, new technologies and understanding the climate change. But something that nobody talks about is the affordability of everything that we're trying to do. Uh, so that's the crossroad that we're sitting with. So when you, when you look at when the minister was announced uh, and when he approached me to come and assist again, I said to him, basically we are, we are asked to stop load shedding. The economy is crying. But the people who can stop load shedding are only at ESCOM. Nobody alone can stop load shedding. So we took nine days visiting 18 power stations, 14 coal, one nuclear, uh, one uh, diesel, 
and the pump storages. So, and, and what we then discovered was that uh, there's a lot of work that's not been done in these stations for a while, okay? Yes, by age, a lot of them are very old, but a lot of them were also brought back into, into the system as late as 2018, but they're now being shut down again, you know? So nobody talks about the fruitless expenditure of billions of bringing those back, okay? So, and, and, and as I said, deliberately, we're looking at stopping load shedding. What can stop load shedding quicker is the assets that we've got at ESCOM. And then, so a summary of our discovery is that we were shutting down our coal stations at a lightning speed, but introducing renewables at a snail speed. So we then said, look, something has to be done. We need to bring renewables at a very high speed. Then came the issue of grid. Uh, where is the grid? The grid expansion is needed. And I, I think there, there are huge opportunities, and hence the minister said, let's listen to them. Because uh, if, you, if you go to Mpumalanga, as we were yesterday, you know, came back very, very late, uh, the people there were saying, tell us what we're going to do. And, 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 and I said to them, but uh, there's also your health that you have to consider. And they said, but uh, you can't decide on our health. Who are you to decide on it? Uh, the constitution, I also have the same constitution that you're trying to, to say it's, it, it's protecting my health. Um, so, but a lot of them are being convinced now that uh, we need to introduce the renewables. Probably not at the scale that the IPPs have been doing, you know, but at distribu distributed level, generate locally and feed locally. A lot of people are calling when there's load shedding and they're saying, but we're in the Northern Cape. There are all these solar panels here. We've never had electricity. Why are they not connect connecting us? But the IPPs are saying, where is the grid to connect? So, you know, South Africa is very, very, very complicated. And, and when, you, when you then look at the opportunities it, it brings, is that uh, we need to reverse the equation. We need to have a lightning speed of intro the introduction of renewables and a snail speed to keep the economy going of the, 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 the current uh, 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 coal stations. When you talk to system control at ESCOM, a different topic comes up. There's the grid stability, you know, you need, you need inertia from the rotating motors of coal plants to can bring the, 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 the grid into, into a, a sustainable way. Uh, so, but there are technologies that you can do without burning coal to keep those machines running, you know, looking at uh, globally they're doing, they're putting condensers because then that condenser helps the, the rotating machine to rotate and then the grid is, uh, is, is brought up to be stable. There are a lot of opportunities on the battery side, but uh, that is still an expensive uh, 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 technology. We, we stand a very good chance on the gas side. We'll be introducing the gas as well. Uh, but as I said, you know, at one rand per kilowatt hour of ESCOM to a four rand per kilowatt hour of gas, who's going to pay for it? Socially, uh, we're giving people 350 rands per month. If you talk to them, they'll tell you on average it's 800 rand per month that they pay prepaid. So by formula, even Treasury has got it wrong, and which is what is a dilemma with this country. Uh, the challenge has to be sorted out, otherwise the energy poverty is going to lead us to what uh, uh, Egypt went into, and we don't want the youth to take to the street. So as we do whatever we are doing, we have to train people. We have to bring women and youth, uh, before she says I've, I've not mentioned what they're doing, so that uh, we can also balance the things. Um, the last I want to talk about is uh, actually last night somebody sent me a message to say New Zealand and Germany are testing a wireless high voltage uh, grid. Um, yeah, look, uh, it is, I know, we are aware of it. But then uh, they say, why has anybody questioned how we produce solar and wind and how we destroy them when they need to be destroyed? Uh, and I think it was saying, to produce them, we are polluting. And that's where I'll end it.
Thank you, Silas. Thank you so much. <laughs> Listening to Silas talking brings my, my economic model and hat on, and you see all the interlinkages. Um, it's not only um, we need the just transition, the just transition is happening, but it's all the implications that this has, um, the economics. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear from, from an economist and a researcher point of view that, um, in a way, finally, the economics of this just energy transition are being heard and looked at. Um, but most importantly, it's the people on the ground. Um, as you mentioned, the people uh, in Impumalanga, who this just energy transition directly affects. We need, we know, we know as the researchers, as the people doing work and important people like Vikesh in ESCOM, we know it needs to happen, we know it's happening. But we need to go back to the ground and how are we going to do this transition and explain these people the implications of not doing the transition. Um, I'll leave it there for me. Um, I want to hear from Bertha since it's um, Women's Month, August Women's Month. And all the work she's doing um, in the in the energy sector. Um, so first give me your thoughts if you wanted to uh, express any thoughts on, on the presentation from the minister. And then yes, please introduce us to, to some of your work and the important work that you're doing. Thank you, Bertha. Thank you. Um, I would like to wish everyone who is watching and everyone who's in the auditorium a fantastic Women's Month that we're we are celebrating in South Africa. When we talk about uh, gender issues, Often it is confused as a corporate social investment activity. The business case for inclusive economies is not often articulated uh, enough uh, to compel resourcing of um, participation of women, youth, and persons with disabilities across value chains, across supply chains. Um, in South Africa, we have the National Strategic Plan Framework uh, on gender-based violence. The fifth pillar of that framework talks to economic empowerment of women that will foster their independence and enable them to live a wholesome uh, lifestyle. Energies has been uh, selected as one of the sectors and we've conducted a study across value chains. And I, wa I want to illustrate how it links to what the minister has presented. I use this um, example, it, it's silly, but it works. All of us use teaspoons at home. But if I ask you, what is the value chain of a teaspoon? To get it to your table, what is the value chain of a simple basic commodity such as a, a teaspoon? Very few people can articulate that. And it shows how we are not having value chain conversations that unravel the complexity of the construct of the value chains and expose entrepreneurial opportunities and employment opportunities. And so when we talk about gender mainstreaming and we talk about modernizing the South African energy um, system, we talk about diversifying the South African energy system to ensure energy security. We talk about improving the transmission um, assets of the country. We must also talk about the constructs of those value chains and the full opportunities that exist where we can integrate women, youth, and persons with disability. We must talk about the areas of entry that present the lowest barriers to entry, that entrepreneurs can be trained if they require skills, or financiers can look at catalytic financial tools to support enter enterprising in those areas. And so, um, a just energy transition, we motivate and advocate for an engendered just energy transition that looks at the impact of lack of access to energy to women and communities. Um, statistics in the world, we have um, spoken about 600 million people on the continent that lack access to electricity. 900 million people have no access to clean cooking energy. The African Development Bank has said it will take um, as uh, electrifying uh, 90 million people per year to achieve uh, universal access to electricity. It will take us moving 130 million people from unclean cooking fuels to sustainable clean cooking fuels per year. That calls for a large investment um, uh, for universal access to, to electricity. 
And so when we look at the just element of transition and we look at all the programs that are being introduced, whether it's the independent, uh, any, um, independent uh, I mean, renewable energy, independent procurement um, uh, program, we have to ask ourselves, how are we promoting an inclusive energy ecosystem? How are we supporting young people to participate? Do we open bid windows that focuses on a young entrepreneur and the challenges that they face to access capital, to access technology, to access networks, to access skills development? Do we do the same for persons with disability? We had a webinar, uh, we, we host this uh, monthly webinars where we showcase electricity markets across the continent. Uh, to date, we've grown to 16 chapters on the continent. And one of the ladies said, as a, as a, as a person living with this disability, when I sign off on a project uh, that has been successfully delivered at a cost that is much lower than what they pay um, uh, uh, other people, I don't sign as a disabled person, I sign as a professional. And so how do we create an agenda just energy transition that enables um, uh, participation across the emerging value chains? The opportunity exists because some of the value chains have not even been created because the technology that is required to transition, we don't have um, the capacity to manufacture in the country. We don't have uh, the skills capacity. So we have the opportunity to collaborate as government, private sector, civil society, to build the capacity to ensure at the genesis of these value chains, we create inclusivity. And so the link with what the minister has presented is, to us he's presented a plethora of entre entrepreneurial and employment opportunities such opportunities that are not clearly understood by the beneficiaries. So how do we work together as private sector government and civil society to educate our uh, communities on the opportunities that exist and how they can prepare themselves to participate so they can use their urgency to go after the, op the opportunities, to organize themselves, to participate, to bid for opportunities, to win. How do we create a supportive um, procurement environment that is founded on the highest levels of integrity that appoints based on competence to ensure that everybody can participate? Um, uh, these are the questions that when we consider a just energy transition that we want to ask. It's not about which technology should take uh, priority over the other. It's about which energy mix will make sense to resuscitate our ailing economy, increase employment opportunities, increase the ability for people to earn a living and therefore widen the base for tax collection so that we can reinvest in our education systems and improve the competitiveness of our labor force. So that is the, um, th that is the, the, the ecosystem of thoughts that we, we involve ourselves in. That is what we advocate for. That is what we want to partner for. And later on, I can speak on their specific interventions, tangible interventions to integrate people into emerging value chains and existing value chains. Thank you, Vesa. Mm -hmm. um, again, many interlinkages, taking it a couple of steps, steps back. Um, you mentioned about energy access and energy poverty and how women is affected in this mix. Um, and what I say back on we need to go to the ground and make the people that is being affected the most understand, yes, you are being affected. We, we recognize it, but there are opportunities. Um, we know we need the reskilling of people. There are opportunities for reskilling. There are opportunities for job creations. Um, but it's always, I think it goes back to the nature of, to human nature, we think it's, it's short term. My, my job is being lost now. Mm -hmm. um, how do we make these people understand there's a future. Um, again, acknowledging it needs to happen, mm -hmm. but how do we make it happen as, as smooth as possible without leaving no one behind? Um, thank you, Vesa. With that, um, Gaylor, if I can ask you to, to give me your thoughts.
um, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, thanks so much. And uh, uh, good morning, everyone. It's really a, a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I think we need to really kind of realize the, the scale of the challenge that we are uh, dealing with, you know. And effectively, at the moment, we are at the confluence of two transitions, which uh, we tend to amalgamate a little too much. You know. There is an energy transition unfolding, just new technologies coming in, you know, uh, the same way, you know, coal previously you know, displaced, uh, largely oil in, in, in production of electricity. Um, now we've got, you know, renewable energy technologies that are coming uh, and on a pure economic basis, effectively reshaping our uh, electricity systems domestically and, and across the globe, you know, and, and that is a transition that's unfolding. Um, it might have been triggered initially with certainly some environmental and climate intent, but now it is driven almost entirely by just pure economics. Okay. You know, it's just cheaper, more cost effective. Um, and that transition, of course, has, has impacts, you know, like every transition. Uh, and there's, you know, there's an economic transition as well happening, you know, more broadly, um, with, of course, economic activities shifting, you know, the need now to produce virtually everything in a way that is, that is low carbon. And that is what we're seeing globally unfolding. And of course, that is intertwined somewhat with the electricity transition. But the two are, are quite distinct, you know. Um, and I think that often we feel like there's a transition in our electricity system and that the, the people employed in that electricity system must remain employed in that electricity system forever. Uh, that is not necessarily the case, you know. Uh, nothing says that you are employed in coal today, you must not be employed in renewable energy. You, know, you need another job, yeah. you know, but it doesn't have to be in renewable energy. It can be, if that is possible. But we need to look at this economic transition more broadly than just that transition from coal to renewable energy. You know, our electricity system is shifting. It is shifting from coal to renewable energy. That is the electricity system. Um, our economy is shifting from one that has to be high carbon to, to low carbon, but that is a much broader uh, you know, transition and, and it is necessary if we want to maintain our access to markets, our access to finance, uh, and actually if we want to tap in the opportunities of tomorrow. You know. And so I say you know, the transitions are not identical, but of course they are intertwined and certainly there are some massive opportunities that we can tap into. And this is where uh, certainly the, the process of the South African Renewable Energy Master Plan fits in. You know. uh, the Master Plan process, uh, which uh, was initiated by the DMRE and, and, and the DTIC, uh, aims to really build effectively our renewable energy and battery industry in South Africa. And that speaks directly to, to one of the points that you know, the minister made, that we need to build up our manufacturing capabilities. You know, as we roll out kilometers and kilometers of transmission capacity, as we build gigawatts and gigawatts of renewable energy and batteries, you know, there's always going to be some imports, but there should be as much domestic industrial capacity built up in the country. You know. And when I see what's happening at the moment, you know, looking at the imports of renewable energy and battery technologies into South Africa, you know, just by the way, over the last 10 years, it's 180 billion rands, 180 billion rands of imported solar panels, 
batteries, lithium-ion batteries, inverters, and wind turbines. Just in the last six months, or the first six months of this year, 46 billion rands. That's $2.5 billion of imported solar panels, batteries, you know, and inverters. And a part of me says, well, that's fantastic. You know, the renewable energy transition is accelerating. We are seizing the opportunities. You know, we're seeing, you know, if I could show you the graph, I mean, it is autistic, you know, skyrocketing, really. And that's, you know, that's the one part. But the other part of me is like, this is really a missed opportunity. You know, this is really sad. You know, um, this is more than enough to build an industry. You know, I mean, these are gigantic imports, really. Um, and we do have the capabilities to build that industry. You know, we have a lot of industrial companies already supplying the market. But of course, they're only supplying a very small share of that market. Uh, and they need to be supported. You know, they need to be supported to grow um, so that we can really maintain the momentum, but reduce effectively the imports and, and, and support our, our, our local manufacturers. You know, when you see the import of solar panels into the country and that you know that our two existing manufacturers are not even producing at full capacity, you said something doesn't add up. You know, you know, they need support to be able to supply. So that is really what you know, the master plan is trying to achieve uh, as a social compact between government, you know, uh, business and labor. Um, in case you have not seen it, the draft master plan is currently out for public comment. Uh, so we hope that, uh, that you can make contributions. You know, the, we've actually extended the deadline until the 18th of, of August. Um, and, and really hoping that you know, in the coming months we can finalize the plan because of course the plan is just the beginning. You know? Then we have to implement. Uh, and we have to put in place the systems and the intervention so that we can really grow our manufacturing base and of course, do that in a way that is inclusive, builds the skills, and, and really answers to, to those opportunities that we see uh, in the acceleration of our transition towards renewable energy that is so needed effectively. Um, but we want more and we need more than just the electrons. You know, we need the jobs, we want the jobs and, and the investment. And that is what we are trying to achieve through, through the master plan. Thank you. Thank you, Gaylor. Um, you took some of my points that I wanted to tell you um, uh, from my mouth. First, thank you for the extension because I think it's a relief for us as the, as the research team. We are saying that we need to put our thoughts into it. Um, so the extension is welcome. And hopefully, um, this fora, um, please, we encourage you to, to provide your comments. Academia, private sector, um, we, we need it. Um, as Gaylor rightly pointed, it is an economic um, transition, it is happening. Um, we should not forget that it's also an environmental um, um, transition, that we're doing it because we want to have this world in, in the future. Um, but yes, um, if I can think of something, um, it, it needs to be a localized uh, just energy transition. We need to exploit uh, the skills, the jobs, the opportunities, as you say, there is a whole sector that can be exploded just if we just look at the one thing, at the solar panels. Um, so yes, something for Silas to, to take on, I think. Um, thank you, Gaylor. Um, Vikesh, last but not least, um, welcome again. Thank you. Um, and then your thoughts on what we're discussing, a bit of what you do, the very important work that you do within ESCOM. And um, yeah, and your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, a summary of the minister's uh, discussion as such, it really centers around the energy trilemma. It speaks to energy security, energy access, and energy sustainability. From an energy security perspective, we need to understand that it speaks to balancing supply and demand. It also speaks to the quality of supply. And we are currently in an energy crisis. And in an energy crisis, while we have net zero targets as a country, we need to bear in mind that we cannot prematurely shut down any of our power stations. And that is not ESCOM's intention 
to fast track the shutdown or to prematurely shut down any station. What we're doing is, as stations reach end of life, the intention is to provide a second life to the power stations and to the communities around the power stations. So that's what happened at Kumati as well. Bear in mind that Kumati was built in 1961. It went into mothball or into long-term preservation in 1990. And in 2003, between 2003 and 2008, we brought it back in terms of what was called a return to service. The intention there at the time when the analysis was done was to bring the plant back for a 15-year period. 15 years was informed by the assessments and the assumption that the country would have additional generating capacity in 15 years from that time. That took us to 2018. So principally, the country did not build new generating capacity as planned. But the plant doesn't know that. The plant has a defined life. Electrical components, mechanical components operate, you maintain, but they have a defined life. Kumati was scheduled to be shut down in 2018. According to the IRP, it was scheduled to shut down in 2020, which was already an extension. The last unit came offline in 2022 in October, and even there, it was struggling to get across the line. In the final year of operation, it was just one unit, by the way, because as each unit had reached end of economic life, it was shut down, spares were taken to utilize in other operating units, spares were taken to other power stations in terms of efficiency of maintenance, efficiency of operations, right? And to, to reduce your cost. So when you're taking out spares from a, a unit, it becomes extremely difficult to bring a unit back online years later. It's important to bear that in mind. So the shutdown of the production units at Kumati was not informed by external forces. It was not informed by a climate change agenda. It was informed by economics. The economics around operating the plant, around maintaining the plant, and around continued use of the plant. Our existing strategy speaks to sweating our assets, running them as long as possible, maintaining them to our to, to, to the best of our ability to sweat those assets. And while we do that, we have what's called repurposing and repowering initiatives at our power stations. So in providing a second life to the power stations, we are exploring renewable energy in the form of solar PV, in the form of wind, coupled with battery energy storage, coupled with synchronous condensers, to allow us to, to balance in terms of provide security of supply. In doing that, we also address the second component of the energy trilemma that I spoke about, which is energy access, which speaks to affordability, it speaks to the social economic impact associated with first day station shutdown, but also the, the social economic realities of the country. And what we're doing is, as part of our repurposing and repowering, we have established what's called five pillars of repurposing. The first is to stabilize the economy, stay, the, the local economy, that is. You stabilize by, by adding new generating capacity. In our case, what we've done is we've identified at each of our power stations Eskom-owned land and maximized the amount of energy, the amount of PV and wind that we could build at those stations. I see you looking at your time. How much time do I have? Because I can continue. <laughs> Let me give you one more minute. One minute? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, I also have the timer on my head. Okay. <laughs> so we stabilize in terms of uh, new generating capacity. Importantly, the second component is to develop the economy, right? We have established a training center at Komati Power Station. We have a have a training center at Hendrina Power Station. We are in the process of establishing one at Hrutplay Power Station as well, because a key learning from Komati was that as Eskom, we started too late, and we acknowledge that. We should have started the energy transition at Komati years in advance when we knew that the station was going to be shut down. And Eskom, like many other 
companies in South Africa went through a very difficult period that prevented us from doing that, but it's not an excuse. We should have started earlier. We are doing that at other power stations, right? In terms of development, we are looking at that. The minister this morning spoke about containerized microgrids as being a solution in terms of energy access. Importantly, we are establishing a containerized manufacturing facility at Kumati Power Station as part of our repurposing initiative. We are looking at a number of other initiatives. Gelo spoke about the value chain around um, the renewables space in terms of energy, uh, in terms of jobs created. We're looking at alternative um, employment opportunities, economic diversification. We're looking at, we have established an agrivoltaics facility. Then agrivoltaics is PV panels at an elevation to allow for agricultural activities underneath. We intend using that facility as an incubator to establish SMMEs based on agrivoltaics. We intend doing a similar thing at Fruit Play Power Station, where we're looking at smart climate smart agriculture uh, in terms of greenhouse uh, greenhouse technology. Again, the establishment of small medium enterprises through incubators with the training center to develop the local communities in terms of becoming self-sufficient and to diversify the economy that centered and that was historically centered around coal mining and coal-fired power stations. It is important to bear in mind that while we talk about coal in terms of, and my comment is not a coal versus renewables comment, while we talk about the uh, concentration of coal power stations and coal mines in Mpumalanga, let's bear in mind the unemployment rate in Mpumalanga, right? It is higher than the national average. Let's bear in mind the youth unemployment in Mpumalanga. Let's look at the gender inequality in, in Mpumalanga, right? And then we start to ask how much value have we had historically from a coal value chain, and it goes back to the point that Steve had made earlier from the PCC in terms of restorative, distributive, and procedural justice. And when it comes to the restorative and distributive justice, we need to bear those in mind in terms of what benefit, and we have established, or we have, we've, had, we've received, sorry, a lot of economic benefit from the coal value chain, but there must be more, and the just energy transition allows us to do that. It allows us to get economic diversification and to expand the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Vikash. Um, opportunities to discuss many, many points that Vikash um, raised there. Um, again, importance of localizing, um, importance of skills training, importance of digging into what the local economies like Mpumalanga have to offer for us and not leaving them behind. Um, it's, it's good to hear the, the lessons learned and the acknowledgement of the lessons learned. Um, slow um, supply of electricity when we thought we were out of the loop back in 2008 with the, with the first very bad load shedding. Um, but now it's time for action and, and, and to move forward and we see it, that at least the plans are there to move there. Um, Part of this platform, and I think our first, while we are here today, um, is also the technologies, the technology implementation, and how does it affect what we were discussing, the, the skills, how does it affect jobs, how does it affect energy poverty and energy access. Um, so, Bertha, um, any comments that you wanted to further say on that? Um, sure. So what we have uh, been doing and what we have successfully delivered is a just energy um, transition skills development program targeting at women officials at municipal electricity utilities with the purpose of empowering them with the uh, requisite information and knowledge to enable them to participate in the drafting, structuring and design of their localized just energy transition uh, uh, and, and, and enabling them to stretch their imagination that the municipal strategy also stimulates the microeconomy. So, so that's one program that we are delivering 
Uh, the second program that we're delivering, we're very excited about it, is on a monthly basis, we're showcasing various uh, electricity markets, the opportunities that exist, how financiers are financing energy projects, and how OEMs are partnering with SMMEs to enable them uh, access to technology to on-trade as these value chains emerge. Uh, and finally, we have partnered with the South African Electrotechnical Export Council for a channel partner program that seeks to match um, South African women-owned companies to global technology companies in renewable energy, in uh, uh, electrotechnical um, uh, space to enable their participation in the energy space. And that looks after the following, access to market, access to finance, access to technology, skills development and networks, which are key pillars uh, for an entrepreneur to succeed in this just energy transition. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's, that's the type of work and collaboration and opportunities that we need to see more of and more exploitation in the future. Um, Silas, I think you, you've been taking notes uh, non-stop. <coughs> so can I give you um, a minute to, to sort of comment in what we have here yeah. from, the, from, the, from the panel? And then, because we are sort of running okay. behind time, I will pose one question that was posed from the, okay. from the audience before, and then we can start sort of wrapping up our thoughts. Yeah, uh, I deliberately stated the power station visits. I was sitting at home minding my own business when I read of the shutting down of the stations and the reasons given. I mean, it, it made sense. I was in Paris when South Africa signed the Paris Agreement, the pledge, uh, that the one that America didn't sign. So, um, when we visited the stations and we talk to the engineers and we visualize what is happening. We then realize that there's a gap between what has been said and what is happening. Okay? And I'll challenge everybody to visit them. So, the plan of Komati in particular was deliberate until that 100 megawatt that we're all looking at. But if you look and you talk to the engineers there, They'll tell you, we were told to close this instead of maintaining it. And by date, we've got all of that. So where are the gearboxes? The gearboxes are in Khrotfle. Okay. I rushed to Khrotfle. Where are the gearboxes of Komati? They're not with us. Where are they? They are with an OEM. Go to the OEM. I was told not to work on them until I'm given an order. You know, so... That, that, that is very, very important as an engineer to close the loop. And that's why sometimes the minister says, maybe we must tell the country the truth. We're not saying no to renewables. But the economy is dying. Mm. Acelo Mittal is, is threatening to, to close down. All the automotives here in Tswane, BMW, is exporting to the whole world the, X, uh, the X3. Mm. Uh, Nissan... The, the beautiful buckies. Who else is here? Ford, the beautiful buckies. VW in, uh, in uh, PE. Uh, um, Isuzu in PE. Uh, Mercedes Benz in, in East London. They're all exporting to the world. Yeah. And a dip or an outage or a load shedding to them yes. is a major blow. So that whole industry is now threatening to move to Thailand. And all they're saying is, don't load curtailers, don't load shaders, and by the way, all of them, if you look at their roofs, they've done solar panels. And I'm saying, why don't you do more? They say, we can't run our paint shop with a renewable. It, these are facts. You are an institution as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a university. I mean, I studied in the UK, I was privileged, okay? Having been a miner working underground and to be taken to the UK. I miss lectures like this of South Africa. But... There's debates that you must protect the engineering faculty that are now out there by people who doesn't even know the formula of energy. You're killing us as engineers. And a lot of them are quiet because they're scared. They can't come in front and have placards and all that. But the balance of the engineers as well is also important. Yeah. Because 
the renewable economically, to me, it's better to put through the electrification fund to give the RDPs solar panels with inverter and battery than to give those people 350 rand per month. But allow them to also put into the grid. You know, when we build transmission lines, I built a line from Matimba to Bulawayo into Silibe Pico in Botswana. I destroyed forestry. Wild animals that were there, within a month, they disappeared. I don't know where they disappeared to. I try to balance it by building small dams for people so that when it rains, they have some water because they don't even have water. There's a bigger debate that we have to look at. The social challenge of South Africa doesn't allow South Africa to copy everything that the world is doing. It does not. Every 40 years, South African population doubles. To me as an engineer, that's a load. When I do a calculation, a forecasting of what do we need to do, how many on renewables, I use the population growth. You can't ignore it. But more than 50% of that population growth is poverty. And I'm not going to keep quiet while my people are suffering and the technologies are running fast. The, the, the missing economy of building these things here in South Africa. Okay? And people want the minister to give them a letter of interest before they start a factory. But when they, they start a factory in India, they don't ask for a letter of interest. There's PFMA that uh, if the minister issues that letter, he'll be seen as corrupt. So there's also the procurement side that we need to look at better. How do we, uh, does our uh, uh, supply chain allows for the women and the youth and the dis disabled? Okay. What happened to the IPP's uh, 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 community trust? Why are there so many noises within those community trust. If there's 2.6 billion already in the community trust, why are people in the Eastern Cape and Northern Cape still suffering? Who are we to decide that they will chow and drink the money if we give it to them? Why are we buying Mercedes Benzes for the councillors instead of giving money to those communities? I'll end it there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Um, All very extremely valid points. Um, and it's that we cannot do this without looking at one point only. Um, as researchers, we keep on saying, yeah, we're economists and we know the cost and we know this. But we need to talk to you, the engineers, which we started doing just before we started. Because we need to understand, I can come with my model, can tell me a beautiful plan of go 100% renewable tomorrow. But do we have the capabilities? Do we have the infrastructure? Do we have the skills needed? Um, and yes, that I think uh, fora like this and discussions like this talk to why do we need to work together? Why we cannot just, plans need to be implemented, but how do we implement these plans? And, and how do we go ahead? Um, I see in the interest of time, um, maybe I'm gonna invite um, just Gaylor and, and Vikesh just to give is their final thoughts. Um, and then, yes, I, it seems like an hour is never enough to have all of these discussions. So I invite us all to further the discussions and, and more collaborations amongst others. Gaylor? Yeah, I mean, look, for me, if I look at it from, you know, an opportunity perspective, um, you know, when you talk about economic growth, investment in any industry, what's the number that comes to mind? You know, it's maybe 1%, you know, 5%. You know. If you're being wild, you may be 10%, you know, and you're being wild, you know. We have an industry that's now growing at rates that are above 100% per year. Okay, you know. Um, it's exponential growth that you see. I don't even think you see that once a generation. If you're lucky, it's once a century. You have a technology or a sector that grows like this. Of course, of a very small base. I mean, a non-existent base, of course. But it is growing at, at a gigantic rate. You know? um, and so we can pretty much 
it's a, it's a conscious choice that we have to make as a country. You know, technology is coming. Uh, you know, do we just import everything? Don't build the capacity. You know, we will, you know, suffer the consequences in terms of supply, in terms of supply chain, in terms of prices. Or, you know, do we see it as a massive opportunity and say, okay, it's not about saying we're going to do everything. Of course, no economy can do everything. But, um, you know, we go and tap, and tap into that opportunity and build as much as we can locally. And for me, you know, if we go fast forward, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, and we've built gigawatts and gigawatts of, of renewable energy in the country, um, and we don't have an industry to show for it, then honestly, we have only ourselves to blame. You know, we, there's no, no one else will be able to blame, oh, it's the world. No, it's us. You know, we need to do the right things to build an industry. Of course, it's within a global context, but you know, we're not powerless. I think we, we need to acknowledge that. Um, and the numbers I talked about, you know, it's already just based on a very small part of the economy. I mean, we also have to, to deal with that, you know, acknowledging that it's probably, we, we've already seen this exponential growth domestically of the base of what? Maybe if we're lucky, 5% of the economy that has access to this technology. You know? Imagine what we could achieve if everyone has access to this, every business, small business, every household. And that, of course, is where the state needs to come in very actively you know, uh, to roll out those technologies and do that you know, by providing energy access, empowering people, and localizing those, those inputs so that we build the local industry. So, so for me, you know, I see that as an opportunity. We have lots of challenges, and we can spend a lot of time digging ourselves into, into them. They need to be addressed. But let's also look at where there are opportunities uh, and then put our efforts into that. Uh, and I think then we have, we have quite a big opportunity for employment, in, uh, for inclusivity, and for investment in the country, and, and of course for overall you know, well-being going forward. Absolutely. Thank you, Gaylor. Um, local opportunities and growing the local economy. Um, can I please take one question from the audience? I know I have kept you, it feels like a one way. Um, um, and then I will come back to Vikesh to sort of give our, the final say. No, I have not forgotten about you, but, but we have also forgotten about our, our audience that we have here. Um, so if I can get a hand up from, from this side, yes, please, the microphone is coming to you. Um, please um, introduce yourself and, and your affiliation and ask your question. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm Cornelia and I'm from Wilster Energy and Communications. That's in the solar industry. So I am a female in this, in this uh, male-dominated industry and we are trying to encourage local production. Uh, Vikesh, I'm very glad that you mentioned the agrivoltaics. It's been on my mind the whole morning. Nobody else mentioned it. <laughs> and um, I'm very glad that something is done. And my question is, is more being done about agrivoltaics? Because that addresses the energy insecurity as well as the food security jobs a whole host of problems is addressed with that, com with that concept. Is there more being done about it? And where can we find out more about it? Okay, thank you so much. Sivikesh, you were not at all forgotten. <laughs> the, qu the question came back to you directly. So yes, if you want to take the question and then straight away you can give your thoughts. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. The value of agrivoltaics is not just in terms of food and energy, but also water. As a water scarce country, it is significant. The Komati repurposing and repowering serves as a blueprint for what we can do. And the intention is to utilize the agrivoltaics test facility at Komati to establish SMMEs, but also to inform ESKIM's decisions as we expand in Mpumalanga. Because we heard this morning in terms of the grid strength in Mpumalanga, the challenge as we expand in terms of building new generation capacity, we are going to be competing with prime agricultural land. And that is where agrivoltaics comes in, in terms of the value. So the intention is as we repower our power stations without 
impacting the operations of those power stations because I spoke about not prematurely shutting down power stations. So as we build PV on Eskom owned land and as we expand in the rest of the province, the intention is for us to have a lot more agrivoltaics so that we don't compete for prime agricultural land. And we also doing we'll be doing a similar thing in terms of what we're calling a Haughty Demo Center at uh, Crude Play Power Station. Now that is based on greenhouse technology. And uh, again, the intention at, uh, at the Crude Play facility is for us to extract some of the carbon from the operating unit to feed into the greenhouse to improve the yield, extract some of the temperature as well in terms of uh, specific extraction points so that we have continuity throughout the year in terms of, uh, again, yield, uh, consistent yield throughout the year. Couple that with a biodigester so that we have a clean way of managing the uh, producing fertilizer, looking at the deleafing, and uh, so it becomes an overall uh, circular economy as such that we establish. So there are many initiatives that we are looking at in terms of um, agrivoltaics and agricultural activities associated with power generation. But to conclude, the opportunities are vast. So while the impact of power station shutdown is significant, the opportunities that present themselves to us are vast and we need to embrace it. We need to to maximize those opportunities or the use of those opportunities. As an example, if we beneficiate our ash at our coal-fired power stations to manufacture cement, to manufacture bricks, to support or to start a new industry associated with that at power stations, we could use it to extract rare earth metals. We could, at a power station itself that has been shut down, we could uh, recover copper. We've got thousands of tons of copper at a power station that we could recycle and beneficiate and feed into the value chain associated with uh, renewable energy. So imagine the story that we say in terms of we've extracted copper from a coal-fired power station that's gone into a winding for a uh, wind turbine generator or a um, transformer in a renewable energy plant. And those are the kind of initiatives we need to be exploring from the opportunity perspective. In doing that, it is important that we all sing of the same hymn sheet and we embrace the just energy transition. Thank you. Thank you, Vikesh. And maybe, maybe I can confirm the Komati agrivoltaic. It's in progress. Uh, the, the land in Khrotfle, it's been identified. So those are gonna go ahead. We're actually saying they are such a small scale, we want to see them on a bigger scale, like what uh, Portstrom University is pushing. You know, so that is there, it, it's coming in. There are people that have been trained to manage them at Komati, we've spoken to them. You know, so, uh, uh, and, 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 and it is a, a huge opportunity. You don't have to even have a metric to have one. It's a huge opportunity for the unemployed. Thank you, Silas, and thank you for those um, concluding remarks from your side, Dikesh. Um, so I think one final thought, we are embracing the just energy transition and we just need to untap those opportunities that are there. Um, don't forget that we cannot leave anyone behind. Um, women especially needs to be brought into the agenda. And yeah, thank you everyone for being thank here. You. Thank you everyone that is here present and online. Um, I will now um, close the, the panel discussion. We are all here for, for lunch time, so please let's continue the conversation. Um, and Lennox. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I've learned so much in the panel discussion. The whole session today has been quite insightful. I um, think that we're taking steps in the right direction and I think most importantly whilst it feels to me a bit like it's above our heads it's certainly reachable which is exciting so thank you so much for your contributions I will wrap up the occasions today uh, I want to thank the acting interim vice chancellor and principal professor Sunil Maharaj for being with us today um, I want to thank the keynote speaker today uh, the honorable minister uh, for minister of electricity for joining us today and sharing his thoughts and what's happening there and 
obviously want to thank the team from EMS who have helped organize all of this. Thank you. Couldn't mention all of you by name, but thanks to everybody. Um, and I also certainly want to thank the United Nations Development Program, all dignitaries and all people who are here today, all contributors, especially all of you who took time to come all the way to Pretoria. Uh, to come here to Future Africa. And for those that joined virtually, thank you so much for being with us. And I also have to give credit to the audiovisual team, Luke Litter Productions, and the iSCAP team of photographers here today. Thank you for being with us. And I must say that um, till we meet again, it's nothing but love and light on this side. Goodbye. <laughs>